Um, if you see the picture that's above us, the title of the message is Pieces. And there are times in our lives where it seems like just a piece of us broke off. Have you ever experienced that? Something happens and it like breaks off. There are other times where it seems like we're completely shattered into a million pieces. That's more of the idea of what happened to Job. It wasn't one bad thing that happened and it just accidentally there's a chip in the cup. It was more like a sledgehammer coming down on his life four times. Four times just in chapter one that just shattered him. And that just broke his life into pieces. And we're going to see throughout this series the, the sovereignty of God. We're going to see the, the grace of God. But we're also going to see, listen, this is important. When in doubt, worship. When in doubt, worship. We're going to see this morning as we look at chapter 1, Job didn't know as much of what was going on as we know because Job couldn't see into heaven. God, in his word, gives us a glimpse into what was going on in heaven. Job knew what happened, but he didn't know why it happened. So we're going to look at chapter 1. I'm actually going to read through the whole, the whole chapter. I don't have it on PowerPoint, just too many, uh, too many words to it. Um, so if you have your Bibles, however you, you read, turn to Job chapter 1. If you're looking for Job, scan around till you find Psalms, and it's uh, before that um, in there. Or if you're on your phone or your tablet, hit the one that looks like Job, but it's actually Job, all right, Job, Job 1. Uh, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among the people of the east. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves. Let me start that again. Period, verse 6. One day, so we're moving into a different scene. We have a scene of, on earth. Now we're moving into heaven. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and who came with them? Okay? Satan came with them. Now that's an odd thought that I don't have all the answers to, but we're going to take a look at it uh, today. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land, but... Stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but the man himself uh, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Verse 13, one day when, jo when Job's sons and daughters were feasting, and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came. The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking. You see, what's happening here is sledgehammers shattering, shattering 
Job's life. One swing, one knock on the door at a time, broken into pieces. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Verse 20, at this Job got up, tore his robe and shaved his head and then he fell to the ground in what? All right, now think about that. In pieces, broken in pieces, he worshiped. When in doubt, when in doubt, worship. And watch what he says. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised or maybe some of us know it as blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Wow. So let's break this down a little bit. First of all, his character. We see about his character. It says that he was perfect and upright. This idea doesn't mean that he never sinned because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What it means is that he lived a, a, a life of integrity. He lived a life of wholeness. He didn't act one way uh, on one day and, and another way on another day. He didn't act one way in church and different at home and one way at home and different at work. He was a man of integrity and wholeness. He was complete in that sense in that he wasn't duplicitous. He wasn't a hypocrite. He was a man of God. He was a man of God that trusted, loved God uh, no matter what. He was a man of upstanding character. Now, maybe you've heard this. This is another thought that I want you to get. I know there's a lot here today, okay? But I'm just going to put it out to you. Let the Lord uh, do his work. Sometimes we'll hear, why do uh, bad things happen to good people, okay? Let's not say that anymore. I'm going to tell you why. Because there are no good people. There was only one good person, and they crucified him, okay? So don't say, why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, none of us are good in ourselves, but there is a question that I think is legitimate. Why do bad things happen to God's people? See, why do bad things happen to God's people? Job was a man of character. He was a man of integrity. He was a man that loved God, loved his family. Job was prosperous, not only in his spiritual life, but in his family life. Um, his children, I, this struck me this week, must have gotten along and actually enjoyed each other's company. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. The first George Bush said this when he was candidating. He said, I'm not rich because of the money I have. I'm rich because my family still wants to come home. It's a great thought. It's a great thought. And I think Job had that same thing, that it wasn't just all of the wealth that he had, and he had tremendous wealth tremendous wealth, but it wasn't that, but his, his family still enjoyed getting together and they enjoyed one another's company. He was blessed in that regard. Uh, you know how important that is because you've experienced it or you haven't experienced it and wish that you could. So you know what it's like. They, they actually all got along. 10 people from the same family and they all got along. Wow. That's a miracle in itself. Ten people from the same family got together often and celebrated together. Job was certainly prosperous in his family. The other part of it is that he was the priest of his family. When they got together in case they had sinned, it didn't mean that they were wicked children and they were, you know, doing horrible things, but it meant he wanted to make sure they had a right relationship with God. And so when they were done feasting, he would offer sacrifice as the priest of his family. He was the head of his family, not just as the patriarch, but as the spiritual leader of his family. Job was a godly man. He had ridiculous amount of material possessions. I mean, to count, just to count all of the animals he had must have been a full-time job. Because by the end of you, time you get to the end of 10,000... Somebody at the front of the count, someone at the front of the count, something at the front of the count, I'm trying to say, already had more babies. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he was so wealthy that he probably had to employ someone just to count. What do you do? I, I count sheep and not just to sleep. That, that's what I do. I mean, he was ridiculously wealthy and, and prosperous, and God 
had been good to him. And so the question then arises, because we know this story well, and even if you don't, I just read it, why do bad things, really, really bad things happen to God's people? So we see that he faces uh, adversity. Godliness never exempts us from tragedy. Godliness never exempts us from tragedy. Just because we have lived for God and served God for many years, it doesn't mean that tragedy might not come knocking on our house. We might get that door knock in the middle of the night or a phone call. Have you ever had a period of your life that you dreaded having the phone ring? I mean, before the day of telemarketers when every phone call was actually somebody trying to sell you something. I mean, like when we used to look forward to the phone calls because you didn't have all of the technology that we have now. Now I hate when the phone rings, but have you ever lived in a period of life that you hated for the phone to ring because you didn't know what the news was on the other side of the phone? Can you imagine Job in his life every time the door knocked? It wasn't even done hearing one bad news when worse news came. And Satan's so cruel that he, 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 like, he just amplified it with each knock on the door. The final loss that he faced just on this day, we're not even going to get into Job's health. That's next chapter. Just on this day that he lost his family, whom he loved, who he prayed for, who he would have been willing to die for. Wouldn't every parent say, I, I would rather take the loss than my child. I would rather be sick than my child. I would, I'm sure Job was the same way. But godliness did not exempt him from tragedy. Godliness does not exempt us from a knock on the door or a phone call from the doctor. But God is still in control. That's what this tells us. When the curtain is lifted or when the veil is separated and we get a glimpse into heaven, a sight that Job didn't see, we can see that God is still in control and that God is still God. In one day, Job was completely stripped of his wealth. 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, 3,000 camels, 7,000 sheep. In one day, all 10 of his children were killed by a windstorm. King Solomon writes this in Ecclesiastes 9, 12. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. A fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare. So men are trapped by the evil times and they fall unexpectedly upon them. We face, even as godly people, and again, you understand, we establish this godliness based on our relationship to Jesus. I'm not saying any of us are good, but because of Jesus, we try to live godly lives. Bad things, bad things still happen. One commentator said, do you think it's a mere coincidence that each case, there was only one left? Just Satan spared one messenger just to be able to bring more bad news to Job. He spared one messenger just to bring more bad news. That's the cruelty of Satan. Job knew what happened, as I said before, but he didn't know why it happened. You know, a lot of times in our life, we might be living through something right now. We know what happened. We know what the news was, but we really don't know why it happened. I hope that by the end of uh, this message today, you'll have a little bit better understanding of the nature and character of God. You might not completely, till we get to the other side, fully understand what was going on, but you can know God in a deeper way, and you can worship him and trust him even in the midst of tragedy. The author allows us into the throne room, and this is what we find when we visit the throne room of God. First of all, God is sovereign in all things. God is in complete and absolute control. The second thing, well, the word that's used for God throughout the book of Job is God Almighty, that God is all-powerful. God is completely in control, that nothing happens without him knowing. And watch this, nothing will happen in your life that's not filtered through his love for you. And man, when you're going through it, that is tough to understand. My question, you know, whenever I'm 
sick or something. You know, God, well, da, da, da. I'm a crybaby, not just to my poor wife, but sometimes to God too, you know. Does anybody, any husbands out there, any husbands when they get sick, any wives want to speak for their husband? All right, all right. Anyway, anyway, but God is sovereign over all things. Number two, Satan has access to the throne. Isn't that crazy? I don't get that either. Satan has access to the throne of God, and God and Satan have a relationship. They know each other, obviously. They, they, they know each other. Sometimes people think that Satan is in hell now. Satan's not in hell now. Satan will ultimately be thrown into hell. In Revelation 20.10, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever. He will ultimately be thrown into hell, but Satan's not in hell now. Satan wanders the earth. Peter wrote it like this. Isn't it interesting? Peter, because he understood the temptation of the devil. In fact, Jesus called Peter Satan at one point, okay? But look what Peter writes toward the end of his life. Be self-controlled and alert. The enemy or devil prowls around. He's not in hell. He's prowling around, seeking whom he may, does anybody know the word? Let's, let's put it this way for our purposes. Seeking who he can break into pieces with sledgehammer after sledgehammer after sledgehammer after sledgehammer, seemingly leaving the worst until last. I know we've all experienced this. When I ask this, I ask it rhetorically. Have you ever been in a situation? It's one thing when you face one difficult time at a time, but how many have felt in their life it's like you're being piled on? Not, not one thing happens, but like 10 things happen. Things seem to be going well, and you know, you're living life, and you're giving thanks, and all that stuff, and all of a sudden it's like boom, 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 and you're like, God, why is this all happening all at once? But God has a purpose, and God has a plan. So God is sovereign. Satan has access to, access to the throne. God found no fault with Job, but Satan did. Look at this quote from, uh, oh, actually, I have it at the application, so you have to wait till the end of the sermon. It's a great quote anyway. Sorry about that. I jumped ahead. But uh, God saw Job as a saint and his servant, but Satan saw Job as just a sinner. Now, let me relate that to, the, to our times. God sees you. If you have right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, God sees you as a saint, Listen, no one else on earth sees you as a saint. But God sees you as a saint. But Satan always sees you as a sinner. And that's why he accuses you. That's what Satan means, the accuser. In, in the Bible, the accuser of the brethren. That's why he accuses you of sin. But here's the good news. We have an advocate whose name is Jesus that speaks on our behalf. Wow. That awesome. Thank God for that. Thank God. When you are just being condemned because of your sin, past or present sin, you can know that's not from God. That's from the enemy of your soul. He's trying to destroy you because God doesn't accuse you any longer because you've been saved. Romans 8.1 says, and now therefore there is no what? Condemnation. That comes from below, not from above. Sometimes the Holy Spirit convicts us, but he does it through the love of the Father, not the hatred of Satan. So God found no fault with Job, but Satan certainly did. Satan can touch God's people, but only with God's permission, and God uses it for our good and for his glory. God uses every situation for our good and for his glory. I'm going to explain this a little bit more uh, in the application. And you know this verse as well. You know all these verses I've said. Keep them in your heart. They're weapons against the devil. And we know that all things work together for the what? Good. For those that love God and are called according to his purpose. How about do you know without looking it up, do you know where the scripture is? Romans 8 what? 828. If you knew that, you get 10,000 points. Come and see me right after the service. You get 10,000 points just for knowing, knowing that. If it's not good yet, it's because God's not done yet. 
If your situation is not good yet, it's because God's not done yet. Because he said all things work together for the good. All right. So here we find Job. We see his character. He was a godly man. And even godliness does not exempt us from tragedy. From the knock on the door, from the phone call, whatever it might be. From the news, from the doctor. Even godliness doesn't exempt us from that. And so we find that even though he was a man of character, he faced tremendous tragedy, which we have seen. We get a glimpse into the heavenly realm that reminds us and shows us that God is sovereign, that Satan was not in control for one, whatever the smallest measure of time is. Satan was never in control. He was not in control of God in any way. And so then we see, thirdly, Job's response to the tragedy, and it was spelled out in one word, worship. Worship. Honestly, I don't know if that'd be my first response. Now, now he mourned. Okay, let's get this straight. He mourned as any human would, and there's nothing wrong with mourning, but the Bible says that we don't mourn as those with no hope. You've all been to funerals where it was a godly saint, and we mourned their loss because we missed them. But we knew that they were in heaven. We knew they were healed. We knew they were whole. We knew that someday we would see them again because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But we've also been in settings where we weren't so sure. And I can tell you that the mourning is completely different for those with no hope. And so Job, he mourned, I mean, to the extreme, you know, ripped his clothes, shaved his head. I mean, this was extreme mourning. But even after he did that, he, he worshiped. And I think one of the big takeaways today has to be that when you don't understand what's going on, when it feels like you've been broken into pieces over and over and over again, the best thing you can do when you don't understand is to worship. And to put our focus of attention back on God. Because God is good. God is good through it all. The first thing Job did is he looked back on when he was born. Naked I came into this world. The second thing, he looked forward. Naked I will depart. Thirdly, he looked up. So he looked back, he looked forward, he looked up. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed, blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. And the next verse says, in all those things that he faced, he, he never sinned. He never charged God with doing anything wrong. Isn't that amazing? How quick me, you, others, the first thing that they do when something bad happens is we blame God. Job never did that. Never did it. He never blamed God. I, I just want to say today, be careful in blaming God. Because God is good. We break it down very simply. Satan is what? Bad. And God is good. And we get those mixed up. We blame God for the bad. Not that we give Satan any credit, but we blame God. For, no, Satan is bad. God is good. In all of this, Job never charged God with doing anything wrong. Now let's make some applications here today. Everybody okay? Both of you? Good. Because I'm going to keep going. I figure it's, you'll just hop in at some point. Uh, okay, look. Number one, Job had a relationship with God. Job had a relationship with his family. And you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. Other. Job had a relationship with God and he had a relationship with his family. You don't have to sacrifice one for the other. You can still love God, serve God wholeheartedly and love God and serve your family wholeheartedly. But if you serve your family above God, then he's not God in your life. If your children are your God, then they can never do anything wrong and you will do whatever they ask. That's because they're your God, and God's not God. 
The problem with Eli and his sons, I don't have time to get into all that, is not that his sons turned out bad. It's that Eli didn't do anything about it. And God confronted Eli with this. Why do you honor your sons more than you honor me? Job shows us that it is possible to have a good relationship with God and a good relationship with family as long as you keep in order the priority and you establish who's first. God is first. God must be first. Okay, secondly, God is God and Satan is not. There's not this battle that's taking place so it's like this, we don't know who's going to win. I've seen comics and things like that where Satan and God are fighting and wow, I wonder who's going to win and all this stuff. No, there's no battle. God has won. He's completely, absolutely, 100% victorious. Then then our first thought is, then why is there so much bad in the world? Because we don't see enough of God and heaven and his nature and glory yet because we don't have the perspective yet that we will when we get to heaven. The problem is not with God. The problem is with us and our vision. And our perspective of things. God and Satan are still not warring. Satan has been defeated on the cross. Absolutely, completely defeated. He's just waiting for the ultimate punishment while we wait for the ultimate victory. That's all. God is God and Satan is not. Although God has relationship with Satan as we've seen, Satan does not control God in any way. Satan does not influence God in any way. Satan does not impact God in any way. Because if in any time God was controlled, influenced, or impacted by anything or anyone, he would stop being God. And I say all this and emphasize it because whatever's going on in your life, God is in complete control. And there's nothing and no one that can keep him from being God. Watch how this, Satan doesn't impact God in any way. Uh, God is sovereign, he is almighty God. Who speaks first in this conversation between God and Satan? God does. Who speaks last? God does. Who leaves heaven when the conversation is over? Satan leaves, because who's in control? God is in complete and absolute control. Satan has no power in the believer's life unless it's filtered through the purpose and the love of God Almighty. We can't always see it now, but God's word proves it. Let me say it again. Satan has no power in the believer's life unless filtered through the purpose and love of God Almighty. Number three, bad things happen to God's people. Why do bad things happen to God's people? Well, first of all, we live in a broken world where there's sin that abounds. Sin is everywhere. And so bad things happen because we live in this broken world. That's why we long for heaven. That's why our hope is in heaven because this world is all messed up. Sometimes bad things happen because we make poor choices. And that's a reality. Sometimes we are sinned against through no fault of our own. We are sinned against through no fault of our own, and yet we still experience the pain of that. Can I just tell you the pain and the shame? Can I just tell you that Jesus not only took our sins, but he took our shame on the cross. And so you don't have to feel ashamed anymore about someone, whatever someone else did to you through no fault of your own. And even if you've made mistakes along the way, when you give your life over to Jesus Christ, you don't have to experience shame anymore because he took that shame, whether it was your fault or someone else's fault. Isn't that good news? Taking my sin and my shame. Rising again, I bless his name. Hallelujah. Uh, we... Uh, Sometimes bad things happen to God's people because God is testing us to strengthen us. Abraham is an example of that. And sometimes Satan is tempting us to destroy us. And the reason I bring this out is because not every time that something bad happens to us, it's a direct result of Satan targeting us. Would that Satan would even know our name, right? Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who, who are you, okay? So 
I want to bring balance to this in that not everything bad that happens is a direct result of, of Satan, but everything that does happen, God is still in control, okay? That's what I want you to see. Satan tempts to destroy. God tests to strengthen us. In every case, though, God is at work to turn it in for our good and for his glory. Next, application. God doesn't find fault, but Satan does. God doesn't find fault, but Satan does. Dave Stone said this, Satan knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. Jesus knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. Hallelujah, let me say it again. Satan knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. Jesus knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. Hallelujah. Look, biblically, when Jesus saw Peter after the betrayer, betrayal, he didn't call Peter betrayer. He called him by his name that he had given him, Peter, rock. And upon this rock, see, that he would give him the keys of the kingdom. And every new work in the, in the book of Acts that was started, it was Peter that did it. First Pentecostal sermon, 3,000 saved, Peter. First Gentile, or first healing, Peter. Keys to the kingdom. See, Jesus didn't call him betrayer. He called him by his name and by his purpose and by his destiny. Whew. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because whatever you did in the past, you're not that anymore. You're not that. And God doesn't look at you like that anymore. All of these sins and maybe terrible things that we've done, I don't know what your background is, but God doesn't call you by that. He calls you by your name. Hallelujah. All right, let me keep going. I've only got 14,000 more points. Satan's attack was really against God. Now, this is why this is important. Watch. Satan was really attacking God. Well, if, if see how he questions, just like he did in the garden, of course, he was dealing with God and not man, okay? But it was really attack against God because ultimately Satan attacks us because he hates God. Watch. And if Job would have sinned by cursing God, then the glory of God in Job's life would have been diminished, okay? Let's catch this. If Job had sinned, by cursing God, then the glory, and let's call it the greatness of God in Job's life would have been diminished and Satan would have accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. Okay, let's look at it a different way. I'll just say sickness because that's off the top of my head. If sickness leads you away from God, then Satan has accomplished his purpose because Satan doesn't care about your body, he cares about your soul. See, and if he can use sickness or he can use whatever, I don't know, your job, your family, your finances, your whatever, I don't know. If he can use that to get you to blame and curse God, then the greatness and glory of God has been diminished in your life. And if you keep blaming God and you keep focusing on the sickness or whatever the tragedy is and you never worship the Lord, then the glory of God will depart in your life. It starts being diminished. Watch, Eli, watch. Why do you honor your sons more than me? Eli and his sons die on the same day. His daughter-in-law gives birth, names the son Ichabod. The glory of God has departed. It started by being diminished, it end by being departed. That's what Satan wants to accomplish in your life. But worship turns that all around. It puts things back in perspective. Even what we don't understand here on this life. Why does the door keep knocking? Why do the police keep coming? Why do the reports from the doctor keep getting worse? Why does the phone keep ringing with more and more bad news? Why, God? I don't know, but I will worship you for who you are. 
I'll look back and I'll say, God, you know, you were faithful through this difficult time. And you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you were faithful then, then I'm going to worship you for what you did then, even if I don't know what's going on now. That even when my life is shattered, I can still find some, some good. I can still find some things in my life that I can praise you for and, and worship you for. See, looking back, just like Job did, he looked back. He looked to the, fu- to, the, to the present situation, and he looked to the future. God, even if I can't grasp what's going on in my life, I know I have the hope of heaven because of what Jesus has done. Not based on my goodness, but based on yours. I know that I've been forgiven because of God's character and not mine. I know that I am righteous because he gave me his righteousness. And even when our life is shattered, we can still worship. In fact, when we doubt the most, we must worship the most. And we come into his presence. And we begin to see things differently. Not because our circumstances necessarily change overnight for the better, but we come before God and we see him in ways that we've never seen him before. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Naked I came in, naked I'm going out. No matter what, I will bless the name of the Lord. God loves you. He loves you, like not just you as church, you in your seat individually, by name, he knows you and he loves you. And he's not forgotten about you because you're going through difficulties. He's not turned his back on you. He turned his back on his son on the cross. So he'll never turn his back on you because of Jesus. His son was abandoned, so you will never be abandoned by God your father. God is with you. He loves you. When in doubt, when in doubt, worship because he's worthy. Blessed, blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.